I'll get collected here in a minute. Thank you for your patience. It's good to see each of you here today. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate the attitude of worship. It's wonderful to be able to gather together and to worship together. I'm just thinking, it's been nearly 18 months or maybe more that we've been dealing with COVID-19. Now we're dealing with the variant. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know how it's going to affect the church. I know what we have struggled with over the last 18 months. We've tried to worship in the parking lot. We've tried to wear masks. We still are practicing distancing. And I hear that we may be required again to consider wearing masks. It's a terrible disease, a terrible plague. And I hope that somehow we can be delivered from this disease. We need a lot of prayer. We need a lot of help, a lot of cooperation. We have tried to video our services, both on Facebook and then on Vimeo. And people are participating. We're receiving comments from people as far away as Oregon. And we appreciate those that are listening and those that are participating. But you know, there's nothing equal to being together in the building. And I hope that there will be soon that we'll be back to normal and we'll see this building filled uh, with, with good people here coming here to worship. Let's encourage one another. Let's do the very best we can. Uh, and we will try to serve the Lord just as faithfully as we can as we worship God. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6. We conclude our study on the book of Ephesians today. And next Lord's Day, I hope to go into the book of Philippians. Two questions. How many of you, and you can respond if you like, how many of you have participated in the military? We have a few. How many of you have faced serious battles where your life has been on the line? Where you have faced the enemy face to face with the threat of losing your life? This passage that we are reading today deal with the military. I'm not sure to what extent the Apostle Paul was familiar with the military. But I know he gives us some good advice based upon maybe your experience in battle. We face a formidable enemy. The emphasis in this whole passage is our war with Satan. Folks, we are at war, aren't we? Every day we face the battle. Every day we are maybe facing the threat of our life. And so the Apostle Paul is giving us some advice that generally applies to all of us, even though we have not been in the military. Back in 1958, I was drafted. I came to Cleveland for the examination. I was convinced, that was 1954, I'm sorry. I was convinced that I would end up in Korea. And so I went through the whole process of the examination and the draft and the whole nine yards. 
But by 1958, I was already preaching and teaching. And maybe that's the reason they didn't call me. I had uh, mixed emotions as I faced the military, whether or not I should enlist. I had a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel that came from Michigan when I was preaching in Dayton. And we spent the afternoon talking about the military. He had all of the papers in his hand. All I needed to do is sign the papers and I would have been in the Air Force as a chaplain. I'd already received my bachelor's degree. I was already a licensed gospel preacher. I was also already working with the school system. I failed to sign that paper. And I thought about it many times whether or not that was a mistake. But it meant that I would never experience the military. I would never be in battle. I would never have my life threatened by a formidable enemy. But folks, I've been fighting ever since. And this battle that we are fighting is not a battle of flesh and blood, Paul's going to say. We're not going to carry some kind of a weapon. And we're not going to be firing at the enemy. And we're not going to be accosted with some kind of a weapon that will take our life. But we are in a battle. We're fighting that battle every day. And we must, Paul says, do everything we can to stand. And if we don't, we will fall. And that fall will be far greater than anything that could happen on the battlefield. We could, be fall, we could fall for eternity. And so the Apostle Paul says in verse 10 of our text today, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He's talking to Christians, folks. He's talking to people like you and I. And he's say, saying to us that we'll never win that battle if we're not strong. If we do not give all diligence to stand against Satan, we will not win the battle. But let me suggest to you, you're not going to win that battle. I'm not going to win that battle on our own. I am not strong enough. And I suppose you are not strong enough to win that battle on your own. And the only way we can win this battle is through the power of the Almighty God. Isn't it wonderful? We have a God that cares. We have a Lord that died for us. And that is ever available to us to help us to overcome this battle. But the enemy that we face is different than all the enemies of the world. You see, he doesn't have any rules. Now, if you're going to go to the battlefield in the military, you have... An Steve mentioned that this morning. You have superiors who are going to give you the rules. And you've got to follow the rules. Satan doesn't have any rules. Satan attacks us when we least expect it. Satan attacks us at our weakest link. I have weak links. I have times in my life, maybe every day, that I'm just not as sharp as I ought to be. And I find myself falling. I find myself doing things, saying things, having attitudes that are just not right. I can't do it on my own. Not strong enough. We need help. And Paul reminds us that we can be strong 
in the power of His might. We have an opportunity to put on the old armor of God, verse 10 and verse 13. Can you imagine? I can't because I've never experienced it. You that have experienced it can understand what he's saying. Can you imagine going into a serious battle unprepared? Why is every military person required to go through the basics? And why is there training going on every day in the military? Why is it when you go on the battlefield that you best be prepared? And the only way that you can be prepared is to experience difficulties, training, exercise, even to the limit of your ability. And so the Apostle Paul says you take, you put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand. Verse 13. It's a daily uh, battle. It is something that you face every moment of your life. And you must be prepared. Christianity is not a fairy tale. Christianity is not an easy life. Does that surprise you? That I would say such a thing? Christianity is a battle. It's something you're fighting every day. And you must be prepared. But in verse 12, it's interesting. He says we are not fighting a physical battle. We're not fighting a battle, he says, uh, of uh, wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not our battle. We're fighting a battle against authorities. Against political leaders. Ouch. Okay. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age, whoever they are. And then against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. What did he leave out? What did he omit? I can understand we're fighting a battle with authorities. And sometimes it doesn't go our way. Sometimes we have to submit when we don't like it. We fight a battle with rulers, political authorities. I don't know how you feel about Washington. But I'm not convinced that Washington has our best interest in mind. I am convinced that they operate based upon their own ideas of what they want in the world and not what's best for this country. We face that all of our life. And so the Apostle Paul says, just get ready. Now, I think about our government. And then I think about the government that Paul faced when he wrote this letter. He was a prisoner. He was arrested in Jerusalem. He spent two years in prison in Caesarea. He was put on that prison vessel. Took him a year to get to Rome. Oh, he suffered so many things on that voyage. And now he's in prison again in Rome. He's facing martyrdom, folks. And he knows it. 
His life will soon be gone. He said, I'm ready to be offered. He knew his life was spent. But he knew that there was laid up for him a crown of righteousness, which only the Lord God could give him. He knew all that. And so he faced some very wicked authorities. Authorities that arrested him falsely, the authorities that were going to take his life as much as they took the life of Jesus, innocent, all for his relationship with God, his preaching career. He knew what it was to face wicked authorities. Let me suggest to you also, he knew what it was to face religious authorities. He had fought the battle with the Judaizing teachers all his ministry. He was beaten. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 as to what he experienced in his preaching career. He was stoned one time in Asia Minor, drug out of the city and thrown in the trash heap as being dead. God revived him. When the brethren came out and prayed for him, and he went back preaching in the same area where he was stoned. In Philippi, he tried to help a young girl that was possessed with a demon. He was beaten severely, thrown into dungeon without uh, any hope whatsoever of ever being released. At midnight, Acts chapter 16, he and Silas were praying, praising God in songs. They were praying to God. It's amazing. An earthquake took place. Of course, God was behind it all. His chains were loose. The prison doors were open. And it was possible for him to escape. But he didn't. He and all the other prisoners stayed right there. And as a result, the jailer was converted and he and his house. And Paul was released the next day. He knew what it was to suffer. He knew what it was to face spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And oh, how we know that today. Don't take for granted that just because we have churches in Ravenna, just because we have preachers who are standing in the pulpit preaching today, and I pray that I can be a little better, but maybe not. Don't consider what I say. Consider what God has revealed. And I stand in judgment every day to make absolutely sure that what we are doing in this building today is ordered by God. And God is being praised by what we do and what we are today. It may not be what we prefer. I was going to mention earlier, I do not prefer taking of the Lord's Supper from these little cups that we have provided for you. But there's things that we must do because of COVID. And I hope you understand that. But I'm looking forward to the time we can get back to normal. But I am confident that we must worship God in spirit and in truth for such people God seeks to worship him. John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. Spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. 
Be careful what you hear. Satan may be behind it. You see, Satan works behind the scenes. He doesn't work face to face. He is working when we don't realize it. He's attacking us when we're not prepared. And we can fall without even recognizing it. I'm not suggesting to you that the preachers, many of them, some may, I'm not judging, I'm not the judge, I'm just a teacher. I'm not suggesting to you that the preachers that are standing in the pulpit today are crooked people, wicked people, insincere people. But I am suggesting to you that many of them are misled. Many of them have been deceived by Satan. And many of them, while they're thinking they are doing what's right, they're hurting the souls of many. Deceiving them, destroying them, allowing Satan to have his place in the church. So the Apostle Paul is giving us advice that we need. In verse 14 he says, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We must make absolutely sure, Steve, as we teach in a Bible class and as we preach in the pulpit, that we're teaching the truth. I had a professor in college. Interesting. Dr. White taught church history. And he loved to give us an essay test. And he would write a paragraph in that exam. And he would ask us to tell whether it's true or false. And we had to explain, if it was false, we had to explain why it was false. And he would put one word in that paragraph that was false to see if we could detect it. See how sharp we were. He believed that one word in a paragraph could make the entire paragraph false. Not true. Truth means that every word that we teach, every word that we read is true. Is according to truth as inspired by God. And so the Apostle Paul is saying that we need to gird our waist with truth. A major part of of the armor of the soldier. Truth is the only thing that will make us free. Let's make sure that we're teaching the truth according to God's word and not taking liberty. Putting on the whole breastplate of righteousness. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Your faith is something I cannot see. No one can see your faith. That's something that's in your heart, something in your mind. But it's that which shields you from the wicked one. Make absolutely sure that your faith is founded solidly up upon the revealed word. And make sure that your faith is that motivation behind everything that you do. It's the power of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. Don't be ashamed of it. Possess the truth, and by possessing the truth, you build your faith. 
Read the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and you will understand a little more about the importance of your faith. You see. In verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I was reading yesterday from the book of Deuteronomy. Yes, Steve, I believe the Old Testament is vital to our faith. And I was amazed at the first 14 chapters, how many times the Lord said to Israel through Moses, make absolutely sure that you're not deceived. Make absolutely sure that your faith is built upon the Word of God. Make absolutely sure that God is leading you through His commandments and through His guidance. You may hear a sermon on that soon. I was really impressed. I've read the book of Deuteronomy a number of times, but never bothered me, never affected me like it did yesterday. What a great book. The Word of God is your sword, your only weapon. And oh, how we need to use it honorably. He closes in verse 18. Don't forget to pray. What, tell me about your prayer life. Do you pray like you ought to? I try to pray every day. But I'm convinced that I'm not praying like I ought to pray. How does the Lord know we depend on Him if we don't pray? And how is the Lord going to bless us if we don't ask Him? Like our children. How do you know what's on their mind if they don't talk to you? When they come to you with a request, do you really know that it's best for them? We, have, we serve a God that cares. We serve a God that listens. We serve a God that has promised to give us everything that we need. His blessings are wonderful. But we need to ask Him. We need to pray always. Not only pray for ourselves, but we need to pray for one another. Folks, I hope you're praying for this church. I, hope, I pray for this church every day. We will not win without the blessings of God. We'll never get back to where we ought to be. This building nearly filled without God guiding us, blessing us, keeping us. Oh, we need to pray. Pray for the church. Pray for the leaders of this church. Pray for my ministry every day. I just pray that God will keep me in the hall of his hand. But I'm praying for you. I pray today that you are secure in your salvation. I pray today that you can trust God and know from the bottom of your heart that if something would happen to one of us today, I've got a daughter, Barbara and I've got a daughter, we have a daughter-in-law. Their life is hanging in the balance and I pray desperately for them every day. Our daughter has been suffering from stage four, stage four cancer for the last 17 years. Just got out of the hospital with a serious illness. Our daughter-in-law is incapable of caring for herself. Her multiple sclerosis has just devastated her body. Let me suggest to you, all of us could be in that condition today. 
I don't know when this life is going to be over. But for any of us, life is hanging on a thread. Don't take a chance of losing your salvation. There's a place called hell. There's a place called heaven. And the Bible teaches us about those two places. I don't want to go to hell. It's too painful, too long, too serious. Heaven is too wonderful to miss. I want to go to heaven. I don't know about you. If there's anything in your life that might keep you from heaven, deal with it today. That's why we offer invitation. Not our invitation. It's the Lord's invitation. You can make your will known to the Lord and He'll hear your prayers. And we certainly will be blessed by Him. If we can assist you in your obedience, if we can assist you in whatever your need may be, will you come right now while together we stand and sing, please? What will you do?